In episode one of The Night Agent, you get introduced to Peter. He's an FBI agent, but he's got an interesting past. His dad was an FBI agent, a disgraced one. He was labeled a traitor, and before he could clear his name, he was killed in a car accident. Because of this, Peter's always kind of had an eye on him. Because some people think that he might be just like his dad, a traitor. Especially when he thwarts a bombing on the D.C. Metro. He noticed a guy get on, put a book bag on, and get off. He looked in the book bag out of curiosity, and there was a bomb there. He saved probably 100 people, but some conspiracy theory whack jobs think that he had something to do with it. While the police were checking on everybody that day, he did notice a suspicious figure, and Peter chased after him, but the guy ended up getting away. The only discernible thing he noticed about the guy was this giant snake tattoo. Maybe the only good thing to come of that day was the fact that it got some people in Peter's corner. Diane Farr, the president's chief of staff, really likes Peter. She's kind of been a mentor to him, looking out for him. But in order to get promoted, he needs the deputy director of the FBI, a guy named Jamie Hawkins, to sign off on it. And Jamie isn't the biggest Peter fan. It's not like he has a problem with him, he just doesn't like how close he is with Diane. So for the last year, after thwarting this attack... Peter has been biding his time, paying his dues, and sitting in a windowless room in the White House, going over reports while staring at a phone, a phone that never rings. It's basically a break glass for emergency type of situation. As Peter is going over the reports on one unsuspicious day, out in the D.C. suburbs, a woman named Rose is waiting outside of her aunt and uncle's place for them to arrive. They're just getting back from Rome. Rose is down on her luck. She was the CEO and founder of a very, very successful tech startup. It had to do with cybersecurity. But they had malware issues, all of her clients bailed, and the board of directors fired her. So she kind of needs a place to lay low because she's broke. She's had to file for bankruptcy. Her aunt and uncle reassure her that she can stay there as long as she wants. And in that moment, it's exactly what she needed. But the first night she's there, she wakes up in the middle of the night to a little bit of commotion downstairs... And when she checks her phone, it's weird because there's no service. There's also no power. She starts to make her way out of her room and downstairs, and she can faintly hear her aunt and uncle talking. They start talking about burning some documents, finishing a job, and warning somebody named Osprey that they're, quote, coming for them. Her uncle also mentions that it's seven days before they try again, and then they start talking about some files. Her aunt says that they need to use these files to warn people that no one in the White House can be trusted. Rose continues to make her way downstairs listening to this conversation about warning someone named Osprey, a drive in the woods, destroying everything that's there. And then Rose interrupts their conversation. And when they hear something, her aunt whips around and puts a gun in her face, thinking that she's an intruder. This side of her aunt is something that Rose has never seen before, so she's a little freaked out. Both her aunt and uncle weren't planning on Rose being up, but now that she is, they need to warn her. They try to explain to her that this is going to be really hard to comprehend, but there are two people outside and they're coming after them. Her uncle hands her a piece of paper and says, take this. Go to the house down the hill. Use their phone. Call this number. Say these words. Night action. Tell them we need help. Rose doesn't understand, but her aunt says, you don't need to understand. You just need to go. Rose then does what she's told. She sneaks out the back door and heads down to the house, down the street. Nobody's home. She's able to break in, use the cell phone, and she calls that number. And that number goes to the room that Peter is located in. That number calls the phone that never rings. Rose tells him night action. She starts to follow the directions that her uncle wrote down, but she doesn't know the answers to all of Peter's questions. Because this number is really for people in the know, and Rose isn't in the know. She's just terrified and scared. Peter's actually about to hang up when Rose begs him not to, pleading with him to help her because her aunt and uncle are in danger. Even though he is supposed to follow protocol, Peter ends up helping her, calling the police and making sure that they head to the location of the house. There is one big issue, though. While Rose was leaving, she saw one of the assassin's faces, and he saw her, and he's after her. He's tracked her to the house down the hill, and he's slowly coming for her. Peter does his best to try to talk Rose through this situation, creating diversions just to stall until the police show up. And it gets pretty dicey, but these diversions do work. The police do show up, 
It scares off the assassin, and he ends up fleeing. Now, anytime that there's a knight action, Peter is to call his boss. In this case, it's Diane. He fills Diane on everything that happened, and the fact that the woman on the line said her aunt and uncle, Emma and Henry Campbell, were in danger. After he fills Diane on everything that he got from his end of the conversation, she says, you have to go pick up the witness. Take this woman somewhere and don't tell anyone where you're going. Peter tells Diane that Hawkins is already on his way, but she gets even more concerned when she hears that. At this point, she doesn't really trust him. She only seems to trust Peter, and she wants him on this job. So Peter heads out to intercept Rose and hopefully take her to safety. And when he arrives, Rose is already talking to Hawkins. Unfortunately, Hawkins has to inform Rose that her aunt and uncle have been killed. Rose is especially confused because she had no idea that her aunt and uncle would be involved in something that, A, could get them killed, but B, that would require a response from people from the FBI and the White House. She's leery of just about everybody, including Peter when he shows up, even though she recognizes Peter's voice from the line of the phone. When Pete does show up, Hawkins is pissed off. He doesn't like the fact that Diane is kind of stepping on his toes a little bit, but... Diane got approval from the president. There's nothing Hawkins can do except sit back and let Pete just take the witness away. Before Pete can take her somewhere safe, he has to stop at his apartment first. On the way over to his apartment, Rose is just trying to make sense of all this. For her whole life, she thought her aunt and uncle were in acquisitions, but now that's all been turned upside down and they're dead. She's kind of looking for Pete to give her some insight as to what's going on, but Pete doesn't know. And he was instructed by Diane to not reveal any information and not get any information until they go through a debriefing in the morning. Because Pete was the one that answered the call, she thinks he knows more than he does. And he tries to explain to her, I'm sitting in a windowless room in front of a phone that never rings. I don't know anything. I'm low on the totem pole. When they eventually get to his apartment, he takes her phone to make sure they're not being tracked. He then sets up a hidden camera so while they're away, he can keep tabs on if anyone's inside, and then they head back to his car. As they're walking to it, though, Pete notices that two guys have gotten out of a vehicle and they're walking towards them, and he gets pretty suspicious. He's able to get the jump on both of them, and he kicks the crap out of them. He wants to know why they're after her, and they say, we're not after her, we're after you. Because these two guys are conspiracy theory nut jobs that think that he had something to do with the Metro bombing. And they want to, quote, make him pay. It didn't really work out for them all that well. He takes both of their licenses and tells them that to stay put. Two agents will be on their way to interview them. And if they leave, they're going to have the FBI banging down their door. When they get in the car and they start driving to this secure location that Pete's going to take Rose to, the first thing he does is call Diane. He tells Diane that Rose is fine, but he also gives the description of the two guys that just jumped him outside of his apartment. She promises to take care of the two guys and also put some security at his building so stuff like that doesn't happen. Because of what happened, though, he feels a need to explain to Rose exactly why these two guys jumped him, and he fills her in on the fact that people think that his dad was a traitor, but Pete doesn't. Pete thinks that his dad was innocent and he never got a chance to clear his own name. And as for the Metro bombing, he thwarted it, he had nothing to do with it, but that's not going to stop the internet from talking. To say this is a hot-button issue for Peter is an understatement. While driving, though, Pete notices in the rearview mirror that they're being followed by a Mustang. He quickly tries to avoid it, and he confirms, yes, these people are, in fact, following us. He tries losing their tail, and then they start shooting at him. As the guy is shooting them, though, Rose confirms that that person is, in fact, the guy from her aunt's house. Now she's really concerned. How did these people find her is the big question. Doesn't matter. They need to lose these people ASAP. There's one driving, one shooting, and they're hunting them. The good news is the FBI has trained Pete for this situation. He creates a car wreck where he avoids the wreck, and the assassins end up getting in the wreck. This allows them to lose the tail and get to that secure location, which is Pete's buddy's Airbnb. When it dies down a little bit, Pete tells her, hey, get some sleep. You need to be well rested for this debriefing. But she wants answers. She wants to know what the hell is going on, why these people are after her, why they were after her aunt and uncle. Pete just doesn't have those answers. The only thing he can tell her is that night action is a counterintelligence program. He answers the phone for night agents in distress, and then he just reroutes the call. 
And people that work in acquisitions don't have that phone number, and they definitely don't have the codes, which means Rose's aunt and uncle were night agents, a.k.a. they were spies. She's got a bunch of other questions, but Pete doesn't have the answers to any of them. Eventually, she gives up questioning him, and she does go to bed, and Pete is left keeping watch, but also keeping tabs on his apartment. Late in the night, he sees somebody on his hidden camera. Someone's broken in. It's two people. They're masked. He has no idea how they got there. He calls Diane. He tells her that there's two guys in my apartment, and she sends in the two people that were paid to keep watch. But once they get in, the intruders are long gone. He can tell that it's the same people that were shooting at him and Rose in the car. And one of the concerning things is, how do they know where to find him? This video, though, ends up helping him out a little bit. He was able to zoom in on one of the intruder's fingers, and he notices a very distinctive ring. He might be able to use that ring to find out who exactly these people are. The next morning, Pete is able to deliver Rose safely to the debriefing. It's in an FBI safe house. Diane is there, as well as Hawkins. Pete's planning on leaving, but Rose actually requests that he stay. And since Diane thinks it'll make her feel more comfortable, she allows it. While Pete is staying, though, he's not going to be in the room for the interrogation. And Rose gets really concerned when she hears that. Even though Pete says to her, you can trust these two, she doesn't. It's because of what she overheard her aunt say about there being a mole in the White House. She reveals this to Pete because at this point she kind of trusts him, but the issue is she doesn't know who the mole is. Ergo, she doesn't know who she can trust. So she goes into the meeting, and she goes alone, and Pete is standing outside of the door, but she's not planning on giving them any information that they can actually use. As for the two assassins that were after them, well, it's a man and a woman, and they show up at an unassuming house in the D.C. suburbs. They tell the woman who lives there a story about how the female assassin grew up there and they want to check out the house. But that was just a way to get inside. And once they do, they kill that woman. They then go to retrieve what they came for, which is a duffel bag, and they leave. The male assassin then texts his handler, done? And he texts back, good, now get back to D.C. and finish what you started. And the assassins are planning on doing that. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel and subscribing to my Patreon. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. If you left a comment, I don't get back to you. I usually don't check the comments unless they're like a super comment. Also, if you don't see the next video up on the end screen, not to worry. It'll be up in a day or two.